And now for one of the most known chapters of Paul's letters, Romans 7. Remember at the end of Romans 6, Paul says, For the wages of sin, the payment for sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of Christ dying in our place. He paid that sin debt on our behalf. Now all we have to do is trust in Christ. Very quickly, Charles Ellicott noted, Paul had worked out the conclusion of the death of the Christian to sin. So now he works out that of his death to the law. This he does by an illustration borrowed from the marriage bond. Because one is married to the law before Christ. Meaning that we are all under a curse because we break the law. Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, to the Jews, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath the husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress though she be married to another man, because her husband is dead. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, being dead to the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And I really like how Paul notes this, because the Jews, they would have been saying to Paul, Well, now it's all about faith, so I guess you're doing away with the law. And what Paul is saying is, the law of Moses is necessary for everyone because it puts everyone under sin. Everyone is that they have no excuse. They know that they're in need of a savior. But also notice how Paul makes mention that he had not known sin. So he wouldn't have known whatsoever, either not at all or not clearly and fully. I had not known its evil nature and destructive consequences, nor in many instances what really was sin. Though his conscience bore witness, it's as if looking through a glass darkly. So Paul says, lest I knew the Ten Commandments, I wouldn't have known that it was against God to covet my neighbor's wife. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. To which David Guza commented, The weakness of the law isn't in the law. It is in us. Our hearts are so wicked that they can find opportunity for all manner of evil desire from something good like the law of God. Even in the law, our flesh desires to twist it. The flesh is so absolutely rebellious that the prospect of something being illegal or forbidden becomes attractive and more appealing to the flesh. Adulterers often are more enticed by the forbidden nature of adultery than the act itself. Verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Now it's believed that Paul is not meaning that he was alive with the life that the New Testament writers so often speak about, that great life. He is alive in the sense that he has never been put to death as a result of confrontation with the law. And this is the way that it is with little children. You've heard that little children can be so cruel. Well, that's because they haven't felt the shame of being evil yet. Verse 10, And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So Paul, once that he realized that he was a sinner, it truly dawned on him that he was in this evil flesh, and it slew him. Suddenly, life is not 
all that fun anymore. It isn't the law that deceives us, but it is sin that uses the law as an occasion for rebellion. This is why Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth makes us free from the deceptions of sin. And this is what Paul is saying that the law does. It puts that mirror up to you and shows you how ugly that you truly are. We need sin to appear sin because it always wants to hide in us and conceal its true depths and strength. Sin is a liar. It'll tell you that you're a good person. It, how many people do you know think that of themselves whenever they're really terrible and wretched and dead? And just as Adam Clark noted, the law, therefore, is the grand instrument in the hands of a faithful minister to alarm and awaken sinners. This is why I tell people all the time, if you don't use the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, to convict someone first, they're not going to want a Savior. What are they being saved from? Verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And notice this very strong statement, sold under sin. That's being enslaved by sin. That the following part of this chapter is to be applied to a regenerate person, a Christian, is evident. Because the apostle, speaking of himself in the former verses, speaks of that which was past. But here he changeth the tense and speaks of the present time. Verse 15. But that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And really what Paul is stating is something that's universal with people. Men, even in an unconverted state, approve of the law of God. They see its propriety and equity. Consequently, their judgment approves of it as good, though their passions and inclinations oppose it. But then notice the very strange portion, verse 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it. Whenever I do things contrary to what I truly want to do in my Christian heart. Now then it is no more I that do these sins, but sin that dwelleth in me. Once again, David Guzik, is Paul denying his responsibility as a sinner? No. He recognizes that as he sins, he acts against his nature as a new man in Jesus Christ. He says, I know that there's this inner war going on between the spirit and the flesh. Just as another commentator noted, to be saved from sin, a man must at the same time own it and disown it. It is this practical paradox which is reflected in this verse. A true saint may say it in a moment of passion, but a sinner had better not make it a principle. Verse 18, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. The meaning is not that he never did the good he desired, but it often so fell out. He began many good things, but he could not go thorough stitch with them. He didn't do it as perfectly as he wanted. And all of us Christians can identify with this. Verse 19, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, which is a fitting time to quote C.S. Lewis, No man knows how bad he is until he has tried to be good. So Paul says, I delight in the will of God, just as David often would write psalms about. He says, I delight in it. I love it. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death or this dead body? And I totally agree with Matthew Poole on Paul's feelings at this very moment. O oh, wretched man that I am, 
The word signifies one wearied out with continual combats. It is not the voice of one desponding or doubting, but of one breathing and panting after deliverance. One calls this verse Gemitus Sanctorum, the groan of the godly. Who shall deliver me, Paul cries, from the body of this death, or from this body of death, or by Hebraism, from this dead body, this carcass of sin, to which I am inseparably fastened, as noisome everywhere wit to my soul as a dead carcass to my senses. It's like you're glued to this carcass. And then the answer is revealed in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin.